ذاك العادل في علا من آب جعل كونا سوى سبحان الله وبحمد الله ولا إله إلا الله ذاك العادل في علا من آب جعل كونا سوى سبحان الله وبحمد الله ولا إله إلا الله من أنزل الأمطار وفجر الأنهار وأنبت الأزهار تزخرف الجبال من أنزل الأمطار وفجر الأنهار وأنبت الأزهار تزخرف الجبال ذاك العادل في علا من أبدع الكون سوى سبحان الله وبحمد الله ولا إله إلا الله ذاك العادل في علا من أبدع الكون سوى سبحان الله وبحمد الله ولا إله إلا الله من علم العصفور في الجو أن يطير ومن جل الغدير ودفاق الشلال من علم العصفور في الجو أن يطير ومن جل الغدير ودفاق الشلال ذاك العالم في علا من أبدع الكون سوى سبحان الله وبحمد الله ولا إله إلا الله ذاك العالم في علا من أبدع الكون سوى سبحان الله وبحمد الله ولا إله إلا الله الحمد لله رب العالمين والعاقبة للمتقين ولا عدوان إلا على الظالمين وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وأصحابه ومن دعا بدعوته واستنى بسنتي إلى يوم الدين وسلم تسليما كثيرا أما بعد our praises are due to Allah, Lord of the worlds, and surely the best reward is for those who have taqwa. And surely there is no animosity except for the oppressor. And I bear witness that Allah is one and has no partners, and that Muhammad, the son of Abdullah, is his servant and his last messenger. And may Allah always and constantly send peace and blessings to Muhammad and to his family and his companions and all those who call to his way and establish his sunnah to the day of judgment. As to what follows, I begin with the greeting words of paradise, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. And I bring you special salams from your brothers and sisters in South Africa, especially from the uh, native aboriginal people there, who by the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are coming into Islam the Zulu and the Kosa and Sutu and Swana and the people who have populated that land for thousands of years Alhamdulillah Allah has blessed them to begin to enter into the world of Islam and I pray that the day would come that their voice would be strongly heard amongst the Sufuf of the Muslimin. I also bring you special salams from your brothers and sisters in North America. Alhamdulillah, uh, just last year over 300,000 people have accepted Islam in the United States alone. If you consider the prison population, which is now larger than the university population, the people are entering into Islam in crowds. And I want to take this moment also on a personal note um, to give special salams and also greetings and solidarity to the aboriginal people of this land and especially to our brother uh, Muhammad who is here tonight. Um, it is part of our way also to ask permission uh, of them to speak. Um, <clears throat> I am also part of the aboriginal people, uh, an African American by culture but my grandmother was a Red Indian, Mohawk. And they are the aboriginal people of North America. So it is part of our way to also represent, or to also uh, 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 respect, and to show solidarity with the oppressed people of the land. Alhamdulillah, uh, it is a great pleasure, 
uh, to be with you here tonight. And it is purely by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that this has come about. There is no other logical reason why I would be here with you tonight and why people of so many colors, so many races and nationalities are all joined together in brotherhood. There is no other system of life, there is no religion, no ideology that has the ability to bring together the black and the white, to bring together the Arab and the non-Arab. And so we have to thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala constantly that He has made us Muslim. We say, Alhamdulillah, in the Hadana li Hada, wa ma kunna li nahtadiya, lo la an Hadana Allah. We thank Allah constantly for having brought, brought us to Islam because we could not have entered Islam if it was not by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And just recently, I had the opportunity to travel uh, to the north in uh, the furthest west, western part of the United States and Canada to a place called Alaska. And in this place, in an airbase, a city called Fairbanks, Alaska, this is a strategic position of the American uh, uh, armed forces, which was a key base right in front of the Russians. And so their key military observation equipment and their most powerful strike force are sitting in this base. And by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, part of a group of what they call their reconnaissance commandos, an elite strike force who fly hel helicopter gunships, were sent into Somalia during Operation Hope. You remember when Operation Hope happened in Somalia some years ago? And they went into Somalia, and by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they saw the strength of the Somali people living in the desert and living under those conditions. And a large group of these people accepted Islam. They came back to the air base and established uh, Salat al Jumwa and called us there in order to give dawah. I went on the air base myself and I even felt embarrassed. I don't usually feel embarrassed with my Islamic clothes. Everybody had fatigues on, army fatigues. The brothers had thobes. And it was Juma Salat and we established the Juma on the air base. And then we went downtown. Now this is a place in Alaska and it is something of the miracle of the Prophet Sallallahu how far Islam would reach that in Alaska it is so cold in the winter that it goes down sometimes to minus 70 degrees. And the brothers had to go out and train after Fajr. They had to put on special equipment and they had to run outside and to train to get used to the environment they were in Alaska and they were brothers from Bangladesh, from Senegal, from all over the Muslim world, very hot places that were living there in the cold. And so we went downtown and we um, established the Dawah and Alhamdulillah uh, some of the people there are embracing Islam, the people called Inuit, you would call them Eskimos. These are the native people who live in the north. And it is so cold in that region that they build their house of ice. And the ice protects you from the cold and you put skin on the inside of the ice and it becomes warm. And so even though it is so cold and so far away, um, Alhamdulillah, they are beginning to accept Islam. And the question that the people had in that area is, why did it take you so long to get here? When they realize what Islam is, their question is, what took you so long? If there are Muslims who have power in the land and the sea, and who are living all over this planet, then what took you so long to get here? And so, we reflected with them on the condition of the Muslims, and the condition of the Muslim world. And so it is in their spirit that I speak to you tonight, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has told us, أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم أعمالكم 
ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما Oh, you who believe have the consciousness of Allah and speak a straightforward word. He would repair your deeds and forgive you of your sins. And whoever obeys Allah and His Messenger has surely gained a mighty triumph. And so I speak to you tonight in that spirit of speaking a straightforward word. Because we need to speak to each other not just from the mind, but from the heart. We need to be sincere with each other in these times. Because the contradictions we are facing today are reaching the level where is seldom found in the whole of the course of Islamic history a time when the contradictions are becoming so great for the Muslims. I say this because Allah has blessed us with numbers. We, our country sit at strategic points. Our coastlines are some of the largest in the world. Over 50% of the mineral wealth on earth lies under Muslim countries. Some of the richest people in the world are Muslims. But yet and still, we have to watch children being gunned down and murdered in Philistine. We have to continue to watch in Chechnya and now in Macedonia, the Muslims in Eastern Europe being shot down, standing up for their rights, but being killed. Where are the armies of Islam? If there are millions of Muslims capable of defending themselves, if there are billions of dollars that have been spent within the Muslim countries, then where are they? It's a contradiction. If there are countries where people are throwing food away, and across the border there are other people starving to death, then something is wrong. Something is missing in the body of Islam and it is reaching a point of serious contradiction and there have been few times in history when we have reached this point in contradiction we look at the situation in Bosnia and what happened when the Serbians were raping Muslim women it is said that they raped over 50,000 women this is unprecedented in history. And in the time of the Khalifa al-Mu'tasim Billah, one of the great Khulafa of the Abbasid period, and many people look down on the Abbasid, they say, well, that's not the Khulafa of Rashidin. But they had Izza in those times. They had Izza. They had power and self-respect. And it is reported that one woman was captured by the Christian forces and she cried out Wa ma and the word got back to the Khalifa the Khalifa wrote a letter to the Christian king and he said release the Muslim woman if you don't release her I will send an army to you whose beginning will reach you and the end will still be coming from me when he heard that the Christian wrote back Saman wa ta'a hear and obey and he sent her back to the Muslim lands with bodyguards, female bodyguards, to watch her on the way, to protect her till she got into Muslim lands. That is the Izza that Muslims had during that period, and that we now need to consider within ourselves. Because for a long time, we buried our head in the sand. We looked at the world events and we said, oh no, that's not us. We're Muslims. This can't affect us. We looked at the crises on the ground. Drug addiction in our communities. No, we're Muslims. That can't affect us. Then we looked at AIDS, HIV spreading around. And we said, well, this is a disease of the homosexuals. It is. That's how it started probably. But now it's in our own community. And we denied it for a long time. And we thought to ourselves, that because we have the Kitabullah and the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ, that we cannot fall into this. But I remind myself and you of a hadith of the Prophet ﷺ found in Abu Dawood, where the Prophet ﷺ has said, Ummati hadihi ummatun marhuma, laysa alayha adabun fil akhirah, 
adhabuha fi dunya al fitn wa zalazul wa al qatl prophet peace be upon him said this my nation is a, is a nation that has mercy upon it its punishment is not in the next life the punishment is in the dunya fitn zalazul qatl fitn the plural of fitna is a trial is a test is a temptation it's a punishment and sometimes in a fitna the one of the worst forms of fitna is a gray area you're not sure which way you're going you're not sure whether to go to the left or whether to go to the right you can have a mass of muslims they can be inside of a masjid and the leadership is fighting against each other and so the masjid although the people are great in number they have no impact in society it's a fitna the second point is zalazul earthquakes the prophet said we would be purified through earthquakes and natural catastrophes and now look at what happened in turkey look at other parts of the muslim world and see what is going on allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has his sunnah and he has purified us on many occasions the last point is al qatl and now we see that we are being killed in large numbers it is a serious contradiction and it is growing so great so much power the numbers but you're not doing nothing with it we are at a crossroads we're at a crossroads we can go in a direction of light or we can go into darkness and allah will punish us to get us out of this darkness in 1258 of the common era a climax reached because of the same type of contradictions the muslims had reached the point at that time it was the golden age of islam and in the city of baghdad the muslims had great ulama they had enormous wealth it was the most powerful nation on earth but it is reported that the slave of the khal- of the khalifa allah ad-din at-tabarisi the slave of the khalifa his land used to bring in over 500,000 dinars per year the slave of the khalifa whereas the ulama who were teaching in Baghdad would only receive a few hundred dinars per month but the slave of the khalifa his land would bring in over 500,000 dinars it is also reported that before salat al-eid the people had to wait for the khalifa and his retinue to come in to sit down you can't make salat al-eid until the khalifa comes in with all his slaves and his fanfare and everybody must come in and sit down then you make salat it is reported around the time of a great crisis they didn't make salat al-eid until midnight you know you're supposed to pray fairly soon after fajr they didn't make salat the khalifa's people didn't reach and sit down till midnight then they made salat al-eid there was no hajj from baghdad no group to go to make the hajj the horsemen the soldiers of islam in baghdad were only about 12000 and then by the will of allah a great change came about in southeast asia in, in northeast asia in the deserts a group of people by the will of allah were changed and went into a form of what we would call in history almost group insanity and the leader who called himself Genghis Khan he sent emissaries into the muslim world at that time the muslims were broken into states the khalifa was only sitting there symbolic 
Each state governed itself. No unity. And so he sent in his bodyguards, or he sent in his emissaries, and they were disgraced and killed, and one was sent back. He sent in another group, and they were disgraced, their beards were cut off, they were disgraced and they were sent back. He went to worship in his way of worship to his sun god. And he said, there can only be one sun and there can only be one Khan. Only one. And so he burst out into the Muslim world with no mercy, moving through the lands of Islam and killing everything in sight. And the Mongols, al maghul had no mercy on anybody who could not stand. If you could stand, then they would have mercy, they'd go around the other way. But if you can't stand against them, they would kill you, take your women slaves, and put your head, heads in a mountain. And they continued moving through. When they reached Baghdad, the forces of Islam, they said, no, this can never happen to us, because we're Muslims. But they came in, and they captured the Khalifa. And the astrologer of the Khan said, you can't let the blood of this man go on the ground. There's some kind of superstition. If his blood hits the ground, you're going to be cursed. So what did they do? They put him in a carpet and they rode their horses over him till he died. The river Tigris and Euphrates ran red with blood. Then they took our books and they threw it in the river. And a lot of our tafsirs, a lot of our hadith, a lot of things were lost at that time. And the rivers were black with ink from our pens. And the disease that came from over a million people killed was reaching even Syria. Then they, tur they turned their face toward Egypt and then they wanted to go to Mecca and Medina. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala raised up people coming out of Egypt, Al-Mamluk, Sultan Babis. And they stood in the path of the Mongols and defeated them at Ain Jalut. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave them victory. But it didn't stop there. This is how Islam goes. It didn't stop there. Then, they gave dawah to the Mongols. And they became Muslims. And then later, they became the champions of Islam. And they ruled Islam in many parts of Afghanistan and into India. Even great tafsirs, great works were done by them. And so Allah used one group to purify another group. The contradiction was so great, something had to be done, sunnatullah. And so we see ourselves in a similar position. And we need to consider the signs that are around us. We need to spend time reading into our sources. Not just reading the Qur'an for tilawa alone, but reading it for the meaning. As one of the great scholars of Islam in Morocco, Sidi Ahmed Zarruq, Rahimahullah, who said, you want to be sincere to the Qur'an? Do three things. Tahseen tilawatihi, wa tadabbur ayatihi, wa itba' awamirihi. Beautify the recitation with tajweed. Reflect upon the ayah. Think about it. How does it apply to your life? And then follow the commandments. It is not enough just to read the book. We have to now live the book. Also, the signs of the Prophet ﷺ are there. And he has left for us a road map <coughs> leading us into the signs of the last days and where we are standing now. It is reported today that the average American person, Christian, the average Christian in America believes that Jesus Christ is going to return in the next 20 years. The average Orthodox Jew, when they look toward Philistine and holding uh, the West Bank and Gaza, 
They are holding on to that territory and maintaining it because they believe that a Messiah is coming. They believe a Messiah is coming. And they're holding on to it. They're looking at the signs of the last days. They make us watch TV. They produce the films for our children to watch. So our children are busy watching aliens and watching Hollywood heroes. But they're looking at the situation on the ground. What is happening? It has reached the point where recently the Pope made a, a trip to Syria. You remember that? Where did the Pope go? They said he, he wanted to, to go along the journey of St. Paul to see where Paul went. But you know what he did also? He went to the Umayyad Mosque. And they say it's the first time that a Pope went to the Masjid. Why would a Pope go to the Masjid? What is the purpose for him to go to the Umayyad Masjid? He could go anywhere he wanted to. Why? Because in the signs of the last days, it is said that Isa alayhi salam would, would descend upon the Manara al bayda the white minaret in Damascus. So the Pope is covering all angles. Even though he doesn't believe. He wants to be sure if that's where he's coming, I want to see what it looks like. So the Pope is studying. He's studying us, you see. He wants to know what we're about. But we ourselves are not putting in the time to know what Rasulullah has left for us. Treasures of, of knowledge. Gems of wisdom he has left for us in terms of the signs of the last days. And we should realize that the signs are many. And realize that in terms of the, of the minor signs that the Prophet said, even that the, that, the, that, the, that the scholars say that the minor signs have been completed. And there are many signs that we are seeing in front of us now in the society. We see the disrespect of the young people for the older people. We see wine and intoxicants spread all over the land. We see lying, kadib, intishar al kadib. Lying has become a profession. Turn on CNN, BBC, and then you will see professional liars who can take the truth and make it seem false. And they take what is false and they make it seem true. They distort things and have the ability to distort things. And so, the Prophet, peace be upon him, did not speak from himself. He spoke from the revelation. And from amongst the signs that he said, he said, and it's interesting, some of the minor signs. In one sign he said, لا تقوم الساعة حتى تؤكل فاكهة الشام بالمدينة. The last days would not come until the fruit of Syria is eaten in Medina. Now, when the, when the Mufassirin looked at this, they said, well, how can fruit in Syria, how can you eat it in Medina? By the time it reaches Medina, it will go rotten. So they said, maybe it's dried fruit. They couldn't figure it out. And we read this hadith and then we went to the store in Medina and we saw oranges and apples from South America. Fruit from Syria, from all over the world, flying into Medina. Sadaqa Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He also said in a hadith that a Bedouin would talk into his riding whip. You know the iqal. Because this iqal that Bedouins wear, it's not supposed to be a nice design on your head. Right? It's a riding whip. So how could the Bedouin talk into his riding whip? Then we saw one day, going down the street, we looked, and the Bedouin was talking into the walkie-talkie. You know it has a piece that hangs like that. So the Prophet ﷺ, seeing this thing hanging there, maybe he would not know what it is. He's talking into it. And so the Prophet, peace be upon him, also said, إِنَّ مِنْ أَشْرَاطِ السَّاعَةِ إِذَا كَانَتْ أَتَّهِيَّ عَلَى الْمَعْرِفَةِ That people would give their salams to each other على المعرفة Because they know them. Not because it's another Muslim. And you see it sometimes in Salat al-Eid. 
The people are out, thousands of people, and somebody says, Salaamu Alaikum. He looks at another person, he goes to the next one. Salaamu Alaikum. He only gives salams to his cousin, or to somebody who looks like him. But the salam is supposed to be for all Muslims, regardless of color, regardless of nationality. It is for all of us to respect and to love each other as brothers and even closer than our own families. The Prophet peace be upon him also spoke about Mot al Fajah. He said that a type of death would come, sudden death. And the people would be dropping dead. And now we see heart attack coming amongst us. People dying of heart attack from the foods that we're eating, from the chemicals that we're putting into our bodies. And the Prophet peace be upon him did not speak from himself. In another hadith, the Prophet said, in the bayna yadi asa taslim al khasa wa fashwa tijara hatta tu'in al mar'a zawjaha ala tijara wa qatl arham wa shahadat al zur wa kitman shahadat al haq wa dhuhur al qalam This is in the Musnad of Imam Ahmed The Prophet peace be upon him said verily amongst the signs of the last hour would be the special salams and, wide, and widespread business until even a woman would help her husband with his business. And then cutting family relationships. People cutting family relationships. They don't want to see their father anymore. They don't want to see their mother anymore. And also false witness. And also hiding the, the, the true witness and the widespread appearance of the pen with the word of qalam and now we see this even more than any time with the computers and the printers going and things writing and writing all over the place some people have so much writing in their office piles of paper and books are all over the place Muslims have more books than they ever had before but they don't have the practice of the people who had no books and so we need to look into ourselves and as Allah tells us, إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يُغَيِّرُ مَا بِقَوْمٍ حَتَّى يُغَيِّرُ مَا بِأَنفُسِهِمْ Allah will not change the condition of a people until they change that which is in themselves. We have too much arrogance and takabbur. Some people feel that they are high and mighty because of their family. Some because of their nationality. Some because of their language. Too much arrogance and pride. If it was blood alone, and we always respect the family of the Prophet, but if it was blood alone, then what happened in the case of Noah, of the Prophet Noah? What happened to his son? What happened to the wife of Lut? What happened to Father Ibrahim? And Abu Lahab was Hashimi. He was Hashimi in his blood. But Allah has written him in the Quran to the day of resurrection. Punished in the fire. So blood alone and family alone is not enough. It's an illusion. It's a delusion which is being spread around amongst us in these final times and the shaitan has become so sophisticated that the attack upon us is not necessarily in many parts of the world a physical attack and a heart war but the attack can also be a cultural war and in these times we are seeing everything moving toward one world government globalization one world culture. And we see it now in clothing. We see it in food. And I never understood this until last year I went to Mecca. And I used to live in Medina for many years. And got to know the people of Medina. And especially the young people in Medina. And we went to Mecca. And we made the Salat in the Haram. And afterwards we went outside to a new building, bin Dawood. And we went inside the building, and there there were people there, 
Bedouins and people from the Gulf area in their niqabs and in their clothing and they were waiting for Mecca Lotto. <laughs> the Mecca Lottery. They're waiting for the lucky number to come around. And you put your lucky number next to the Kaaba. And then when it's time to eat, where do they eat at? McDonald's. Kentucky Fried Chicken. Baskin Robbins. This is where they eat. The young people, all of them, they don't want their food. They don't like their spices. They want burgers and french fries. Globalization. One world culture and one world government. In Medina, we saw, we made salat in, 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 in the masjid, masjid al-Nabawi, and, and a little Arab boy was making salat. He made, he stood up, and he had his thobe on, and he had a baseball cap on. That's the new style. <laughs> they have a baseball cap and a thobe. Okay? And I'm not saying it's haram to wear a baseball cap, right? But it was strange to me to see him in this baseball cap and a thobe, because a baseball cap means something to a person from America, right? We know what it really means. So it was time for Salah, and he turned the baseball cap around to make Salah, and the name was Levi's. <laughs> Levi's is Levi, a Jewish tribe, a family of the Yahud in New York City who made millions of dollars making pants. So now he's got Yahudi on the top, and then the rest of him is, is Arabi, is from here down. And so they attack you right through the nausea, right through your head. Using that tube in the television, sending the message straight into the control part of the brain. And so this is happening to the young generation, so they feel more comfortable in the Western clothes than in their own Islamic clothes. One world culture moving towards one government. It is not yet the Dajjal because he's a person. But it is the Dajjalic type of culture. Making you hate yourself. You're living in a false paradise. And when the Dajjal would come with Iyadu Billah, he will have something that seems like a Jannah. And he has another one that seems like a fire. That's his test. And so you look at the discotheque, the lights are flashing, and everybody's smiling, and the Olympics are here. And then on the other side they say, look at Soma Ramadan, they can't eat. And this happened to us in Cape Town, in South Africa. They had one of the largest events was happening on the millennium. And the millennium night was falling in Ramadan, you remember that? on the odd nights in Ramadan, last 10 days, fitna, and they were targeting Muslims in our city. It is so bad in our city because there's 120 masjids in the city, and the movement has potential to grow. They build the discotheque, it looks like Masjid al-Aqsa, and they have seven levels of dancing called rave. Seven levels, like seven heavens. And they even have a special place inside the discotheque for some Muslims who are uh, uh, maybe hypocrites or whatever, but if you're hungry, you can eat halal food. <laughs> they have halal food in the discotheque. You see? Who is that to catch? The Muslim youth. It's to catch the Muslim youth. Because they are preparing for the last days. They see it coming. They see Armageddon. A major war. And if our young men are like little girls with rings in their ears and ponytails and they're not sure if they're male or female, how are they going to stand up against the enemies of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? How are they going to do that? So they attack in the youth, sending them messages to take them off the path.
But we need to consider this. We need to look into our communities and to provide alternatives for the youth. Teach the young men how to be Muslim men. Let them play sports. Let them learn martial arts. Take them out into the woods. Let them get up in the cold and make fajr. Teach them rujula to be men. Otherwise they will be taught to be little girls. So they will not be able to stand against the enemies of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We have too much hasad. We have too much hatred and envy in our hearts. It's too much, man. If a Muslim makes a little bit of progress, the other ones look at him. They get jealous. He gets a new car, or they get a baby, and the other ones look, they, they, they hate it. Now Hassad, if he has a new car, and you want one, that's okay. But if you want one, and you don't want him to have his, that is Hassad. You understand? You want it, and you don't want him to have it. They have the baby, you want a baby, a beautiful baby. But you don't want, you hate this. And the shaitan uses this evil uh, feeling in order to hurt the people. And the Prophet ﷺ said, إِيَّاكُمْ وَالْحَسَدِ فَإِنَّ الْحَسَدِ يَأْكُلْ حَسَنَاتِ كَمَا تَأْكُلْ النَّارُ الْحَطَبِ Beware of jealousy. It eats up your good deeds like a fire eats up firewood. You go to Hajj, you fast, Hasad burns it up. You pay zakat, Hasad destroys it. Everything you try to do. And in one hadith, the Prophet ﷺ and his companions were sitting, and a man came walking down the lane. And the Prophet upon him said, This man is from the people of paradise. He came down the lane again, his beard was wet with wudu, and the Prophet ﷺ said, This man is from the people of Jannah. The third time he came down again, he said, This man is from the people of Jannah. And so afterwards, one of the Sahaba, Amr ibn As, came to the man and said, I want a trap, can I stay by you for three days? I have some hajj, a, a need. He said, okay, you stay here, man. And so he watched him. He watched him daily, he watched him at night. After the third day, he said, I have to tell you the truth. I don't have this hajj. I don't have the need. But you, the Prophet said, you will be of the people of paradise. What is it that you do? You didn't even get up and make the hundred. What do you do, man? And so he said, Oh yeah, and then Amr said, I saw you as you turned over, you said, Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. That's all I saw. The man said, I'm just like you. I fast like you. I pray like you. But I don't have any jealousy in my heart for the Muslims. I don't hate anybody, man. I don't hate anybody. And I have no desire for the property of other believers. I have not, his heart was clean. Inside. This is a key issue that we need to look at in these coming times. The internal Muslim. To reanalyze our relationship with each other. Reanalyze our relationship with our community. Close ranks. If there is a Muslim who is 90% similar to you, 10% different. Why do we look at the 10%? We spend most of our time looking at the 10% instead of uniting with the 90%. If he's different, make dua for him. Give him nasiha, give him advice and make dua for him. But don't bring him down, man. Don't attack him. We have too many enemies. It is a slick deceiver. That the shaitan al iyadu billah is using deception on us. Using deception. We look at taqwa every time when the, when the, the khatib gives the, the Juma al khutbah, he talks about taqwa. Al khawf wa raja. Fear and hope. And one of the great scholars of Islam, Ibn Qudama al Maqdasi, rahimahullah. He, he looked at this and he said, Al Khawf wa Raja, these are two stimuli. It stimulates you to do something. If you fear something, you run from it. If you hope in something, you move towards it. And he said, any.
thing that takes you, that, that stops you from action. It makes you sit down. It is horror. It is deception. An illusion or a delusion. Because something is holding us down. Even if we come to the masjid, something's holding us down to go further, to establish more Islamic institutions, to, to spread the message out in society. Some forms of ghurur comes, like in the case of a man uh, uh, who is deceived by hayat dunya And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, وَمَا hayat dunya إِلَّا مَتَاعَ الْغُرُوَةِ the life of this world is nothing but material deception. And in Canada, a man won the lottery. 21 million dollars. And the people said, he's in paradise. What else does he need, man? 21 million dollars. And his daughter, they came, him and his daughter on TV. But the man said, may God help us. He had some sense, right? They started to call his house. They wanted to marry his daughter. They wanted to start a business with him. He had to hide himself. He changed his address. He had to hide with his family. So the money that was supposed to liberate him put him in jail. Another man in the UK, he won the lottery 25.5 million pounds. The whole society said, he's in paradise. He's got everything, man. And he started to eat food. He ate food until he weighed 310 pounds and he dropped dead. <laughs> so the money that was supposed to give him life, took his life. وَمَا الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا إِلَّا مَتَاعُ الْغُرُوَةِ Another form of deception is the one where the family the person thinks because his family are good Muslims, then he's okay. So he says, I don't have to give sadaqah. I don't have to make salah. My father used to give sadaqah. My father used to make fajr. I don't have to make fajr. He is deceived. Because he will stand by himself on the day of resurrection. Another form of deception comes when the person that has hasanat and say ye at. Good deeds and bad deeds. He wakes up in the morning and he makes istighfar. And he asks Allah to forgive him a hundred times. Then the rest of the day, he curses people. He backbites. He scandalizes. He says, he, everything comes out of his mouth. But he thinks because he made istighfar, that the other deeds don't mean anything. He is deceived. Because the Prophet ﷺ said, لا يدخل الجنة نمام The one who spreads scandal will not enter paradise. Another form of deception that is coming in is a form of deception where the students, people coming into Islam are learning ilm al-khilaf. They learn the knowledge of disagreement. So before they learn the usul, the basis of their faith, they learn how to argue with other people. So they argue with you about fiqh, they argue and argue and argue. And we spend all our time arguing about this and arguing about that. And the Prophet ﷺ said, مَا ضَلَّ قَوْمٍ قَدْ بَعْدَ هُدَى إِلَّا أُوتُ الْجَدَلِ That people would not go astray after guidance until they were given argumentation. It is a form of deception. And so we need to now realize the slip program that is going on outside coming culturally, coming to deceive us because we are moving rapidly toward the last days. And we pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would have mercy upon us and would give us the strength to unite ourselves. The major signs are close. But if a leader comes to unite the Muslim world, are we with him? Will we be with him? The signs are coming close. May Allah give us the strength to prepare ourselves. And may Allah help us to prepare the younger generation. Make them strong. Give them knowledge. Give them confidence in themselves. 
build their taqwa, break down tribalism. There's no difference in white and black, no difference in Arab and non-Arab. It's only taqwa that makes the highest individual. May Allah have mercy on us and unite our ranks and give strength to the Mujahideen in Philistine. May Allah give victory to the Mujahideen in Macedonia and in Kashmir, in Chechnya, wa fi kulli makan, in every place, Ya Rabbil Alameen. Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana, wa fi al-akhirati hasana, wa qina adhab anna, wa al-khilna al-janna ma'a rabla, ya azizu, ya ghafaa, ya Rabbil Alameen. Aqulu quli hadha, wa astaghfirullahi wa lakum, wa salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.